Hi, everyone. Um, this is Mukanda Raghavan, and uh, welcome to another episode of Mirror Media. Today, we are joined by Suhag Shukla, who is uh, the director of uh, Hindu American Foundation based out of Washington, D.C. Um, and she and her team have been, to be honest, one of the most vibrant and vital organizations within, I mean, I, we say North America, but primarily America, uh, the United States of America, in addressing both cultural, um, political, and media issues that the Hindu community at large deals with. So um, it's a pleasure to have Suhag on today, and I kind of want to open the door for you to, to introduce yourself and kind of uh, let's just talk about your background first before we get into the other topics, because I think it's uh, um, it's one of the things is when we have these kind of podcasts and a few of these have popped up over the last few probably last year to be honest like i think there's uh kushals and shams um and you've been on both of theirs and i think you've also yes. been on uh, brown pundits um, i have taken my rounds <laughs> uh, uh but it's it's an interesting new ecosphere that we're having uh with all these brown people with cultural ties actually being able to talk about our culture and our history and traditions and i think it's it's more than time that you guys actually came out and started talking with us instead of talking to the the the, the non-hindu public in many ways about the idea of hinduism and being hindu outside of india so without further ado uh shukla uh i mean, I mean uh, uh suhag welcome to the show and if you can can you give us a little bit of background on yourself sure thank you mukanda for for having me here and um you're right it's it's really um i think an exciting time for us because we at hef you know obviously monitor the the media and we can talk about that later but what's been frustrating to us is not seeing that sort of content that is really taking a deep dive into a lot of the different topics that you know, affect us on a day-to-day -day basis that might affect or inform our understandings of our tradition and the relevance of old, you know, ancient teachings and how they might take shape uh, to address contemporary issues. So um, definitely uh, a welcome uh, phenomenon, so to speak, right. of, of this increasing um, number of channels and podcasts and all that sort of stuff. So I'm the daughter of immigrants. My father came here in the early 60s um, to pursue his master's degree and then um, went back to India, met my mom, uh, came back and I was born in uh, 1971 um, in the San Francisco Bay Area when it was not as diverse as it is today. Uh, obviously, probably right. just at the early turning edge of even computers, Apple computers was... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably just a seed in, in someone's mind and in, not even in a garage yet, right? Yeah, so right. a very, a very different uh, time in the United States. So I, I think at least based from my anecdotal uh, experience, I very rarely meet people who were older than me because we were kind of the firstborns of right. that generation. So for instance, the first temple... I didn't actually go to a temple until maybe I was at least five or six. Prior to that, my introduction or exposure to Hindu practice was primarily home practice, seeing my grandmother lived with us. So seeing her day-to-day -day practice, um, I'm just going to turn off some of these notifications. So they're oh, hanging. Sorry about that. Um, but, um, you know, seeing her daily home practice, uh, she used to record reading the Gita out loud. Um, and yeah. so hearing that, and then um, just in the times that we sat with her, we would hear the stories of Prahlad or Dhruva or Mirabai. Uh, yeah. So that was kind of my earliest exposure to the tradition, uh, really a familial um, setting. Uh, and then you started seeing kind of the expansion of the community and institution building so that first level was the linguistic groups. So right. Ajayi Samaj is where I started seeing the cultural practices, then temples started emerging, and then um, finally Balbihars. Uh, yes. So um, as I started becoming a teenager and asking a lot of questions of, you know, it, it just wasn't enough for me to just do what I was told. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
but really wanting to understand things and then make a decision for myself as to whether it, uh, whatever the practice was, mm -hmm. whether it kind of resonated with how I saw the world and my purpose in it. And um, so when my parents kind of hit a wall of not necessarily being able to answer my questions, because, you know, like many uh, Indian Hindus, you kind of grow up in an environment where it's just part part of the ethos, you part of tradition. So you just do things because that's how the way they've always been done. And right. on top of that, you don't necessarily have someone questioning you as to why you do things. And um, so you never even have necessarily the opportunity to stop and think like, why do we do this? Right. So all of that together um, and them at least having, I feel the humility and the intellectual curiosity to say, well, we don't know how to answer you in a way that's satisfying your needs and we ourselves want to know and so that's when uh they started asking around and and we discovered that jinma mission had just started um, right. and so i started there and my journey um in still wanting to learn about the tradition and the philosophy continued and ended up manifesting as a bachelor's in religion right. um, so it's something uh, at least in terms of wanting to know about our tradition and um, the history has, I think that seed was planted very early, probably from a past life or, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a, a couple questions. So you're, I mean, uh, uh, it seems clear that your family is Gujarati and you guys came in 71. So were you born in India or were you born in the born States? born in, in California. So I'm a native Californian. Okay. And I'm sure it was, I don't think Livermore Temple at that time was. No, yet. I actually went to the groundbreaking for okay. the Livermore Temple. So yeah. I mean, that's how far back. Fremont, there's a temple in Fremont. I remember going to the grand opening of the Fremont Temple. Right. And, right. and um, prior to that, well, the very first temple I ever went to was the ISKCON Temple in Berkeley. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so that was that was the very first temple that I had ever been to. You know, I, th I think it's kind of interesting that many Hindus, when they come to the states, at least, I mean, I'm I'm a few years younger than you, but still, like very probably similar experiences, is their first sometimes their first exposure, especially in the early, uh, I mean, 70s and 80s, was actually the ISKCON first yes. before to any sort of uh, like. I mean, I, I don't want to say ISKCON isn't native, but like a native traditional temple that probably right. we're used to nowadays, right? Like ISKCON's, it's, they're Hindu, but it's, it's. I don't know if they consider themselves Hindu. It, it, that's always been like a, in between like a, a dialogue within their system. But uh, for me, it's it's a very Hindu system, right? Um, Absolutely. I, I mean, the, I think the, the most accurate um, description that I have seen or self-identification right. is being of the uh him being of the hindu godia vaishnava tradition which i think yeah. you know that that is a good uh comprehensive description um, right. but, but, but it's also because it's it's composed mostly of non-indians mm -hmm. it, it has it, it it doesn't have all the the cultural i, I wouldn't tra nut trappings but the I would say flowerings that in, in, we have within each of our cultures, like a Gujarati temple will be different from like a Tamil temple or Karnataka temple or sure. Bengali temple. Right. So, well, it, so I, I, you know, I think that in some ways I actually, so when I first went, I was a little bit confused <laughs> because especially when you've grown up seeing the tradition within your family or maybe a little bit broadly with maybe five or 10 families, right. there's definitely a certain cultural context and, and that too subcultural context. So, you know, if, if my family's uh, friend circle was primarily Gujarati, then it's going to be a very good Like the bhajans that we sing are Gujarati. Way in which we tell the stories and things are going to yeah. be in Gujarati. Uh, but um, I do remember feeling a little confused because you did see primarily, you know, people of European descent, but then they yeah. were wearing dhotis, they were wearing yeah. sarees, and they were singing songs, but their accents tend to be Bengali, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, you, you hear the words and, and it still sounds different, primarily because there is, I think, a little bit of that, not a little bit, but there is a Bengali culture 
um, uh, or cultural practices and the bhajans and everything like that are in, in Bengali. So I thought it is definitely interesting. I was for sure confused. It was probably my first exposure to Hinduism as a global tradition without really having those words to find. Yeah. So, so like before you went to ISKCON, did you, I'm sure you went to Gujarat at some point before, or did you go to temples in India or was this like well before even that? It was well before that because I, I think my first trip to India was my uncle's wedding, which was like 76 or 77. Okay. So I was already six or seven before my first trip. You know, back okay. then you, you have families who are really just trying to make ends meet and yeah. they're, they're just getting established. So going to India was a luxury. I mean, just making long distance phone calls was a luxury. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, it had to be something big to be right. going back home. And, and it happened to be my my uncle's wedding. Um, but I, you know, and, and the few the few fleeting memories I have from the time I was six, I I do still remember like a sense of belonging, like oh wow, everyone looks like me. Yeah. Um, you know the, the the foods and the smells and everything. So there there was this, and I still feel that to this day. Um, even though people when I go back to India are like oh you Americans you know, and you get a little bit of that, there's still, there's still a very strong sense of belonging. Yeah, I mean, I, I went to Gujarat uh, the first and only time was like in 2000, and I was there for about a month. So I spent uh, time traveling through Amavad and Porbandar and Dwarka, mm -hmm. Somnath, and just kind of did like a, a big tour of Gujarat. And it's so, I know it's so fascinating because it's uh, one of the things I, I, I remember is like, because Ahmedabad is, uh, you know, the capital, there's a big influence of uh, of Srinachi from Baroda, right? You know, yeah. and but you go, if you go to Dwarka region, there's more of uh, Ramanuja Vishishtadvaita influence. There's in the middle of Dwarka, there's this pillar that okay. was um, put there in the 11th, 10th, 11th century by Ramanuja Charya, and it's still written in the Devanagari Sanskrit, and it's it's kind of really interesting to see how the different regions have different practices like so not there's less Vaishnava and more more Shaiva and it's just so, so diverse in terms of how their practices are um and, it, and that's just in one region within oh. like an area that's so diverse it's kind that's, of cool absolutely and and even even not just intra but even inter I mean I have family members who are Jane uh, yeah. so you know you see a lot of that as well um not just in Gujarat throughout India that's why um, it's probably more I, so in Gujarat because the Jains really aren't that prevalent outside of Gujarat that much. There's some in uh, Punjab, um, and, Rajasthan, and then Rajasthan. You probably see a lot of that as well. Yeah, but uh, there is um, there is tremendous diversity, and yeah. in some sense, I think travel and communication are starting to um, you know they're 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 trying to they're starting to create a lot of overlap or familiarity. Um, but that familiarity comes with, with ease, right? right. In, in the sense that there's still, even with the diversity, there are still underlying, there's an underlying ethos. Exactly how you can articulate it is, I think, the challenge for all of us. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but there is, there is, and I don't think people fully comprehend the the amount of diversity. My husband, for instance, is from uh, from Saurashtra. So yeah, Saurashtra. Yeah. my family hails from the northern part of Gujarat. So even in the language itself, someone just recently told me that the Kachavari Gujarati is has closer affinity to Sanskrit than northern Gujarat, where there was greater Persian influence in the language. Sure. So um, from language to practices, to dietary, even within that, and we're both Hindu, um, yeah. there's still, there were so many differences, you know? So are your, is your husband's side from a different, I, mean, I hate the word sect, but a different uh, tradition than your side, your month, than your side was? So my, we were, we're Prashti Marg Vaishnavs on my mom's side of the family primarily. Um, and my my father's side were they were maybe more Vaishnava slash Sanatanis, but definitely on my mom's side, very strict Vaishnavas to the extent where it's really just 
you know, not even Vaishnava, but it has to be Srinagji, you know, yeah, that yeah. level. Um, and then on his side, uh, probably Shaivite in their roots, but also kind of uh, uh, practicing more Sanatani Hinduism. So, so, so when you say Sanatani, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that they're equally comfortable. So my, so, so my, Asim's maternal grandfather, for instance, strong Advaitin, mm -hmm. but then, you know, uh, took uh, Diksha from Prabhupada okay. and practiced as a Gaudiya Vaishnava, Vaishnava for a while, then came back to Advaita, would be equally comfortable going to a Durga temple. And so there's just kind of, to me, a Sanatani is kind of like a pan Hindu practitioner yeah. who isn't necessarily tied to any one particular deity or sect and um you know i guess that's the best way to explain it technical but that's that's how i see it yeah it's, it's always difficult because like these I, I think these these categories we place ourselves in are are unnatural in some sense mm -hmm. because uh, it, it, it's a way we identify ourselves but that's our primary identification world. Like many of us will probably go to any temple, worship right. any god, even though we belong to a particular tradition. I mean, I, I think within that's just the way, like, whatever Hindu term you want to call it is. You know, it's kind of porous. You just kind of move around wherever there's that gap. You go to that gap and you exactly. fill it in. Exactly. And I think that in some sense, the temples here in the United States reflect that. Okay. So, uh, the Livermore Temple is a good example. Uh, the temple that we used to attend, we lived in Minneapolis for six years, but the temple out there in Maple Grove, where they have many temples that are dedicated to different deities, and yep. it's all housed under one building. And so, you know, on a Monday, if you just want to do Abhisheka, Marudra Abhisheka, or whatever, then yep. that's where you go and there's something going on there. Um, if it's Tuesday and you want to worship Hanuman, you can go to the mini temple and it's all under one building and everyone is there. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't see those types of temples in India, um, or at least I, I haven't run across one. It's usually, you know, it's a like Somnath, it's a Shiva yeah. temple. Um, and a Srinathji is a, is a Krishna temple. So I don't see that, but I do, I do like that because it, um, it reflects, I think our, our internal way of being for many of us. Yeah, I mean, and also the difference is, um, I mean, and obviously, like, I, I I live in L.A., so we have the Malibu Temple, which is similar to what you said, right? There's, like, the, there's the Vishnu complex and the Shiva complex, mm -hmm. and they each have, you know, the, the deities that, the, the, the pantheon of deities that connect to that particular deity. Um, but in India, obviously, the difference would be primarily is that the each kshetra or each location has its own history, its story, and uh, and they have what's known as stella purana, uh, basically <laughs> connecting why that particular deity is worshipped there. And right. then when those temples built, they had to follow the agama and traditions, which which would limit the the deity to being one deity in that location. In that unless place. unless it was like a merger deity like Hari Hara or Ardhanaishwara, you know, th mm -hmm. that's a little separate. But yeah, I mean in in this sense also I think for us it's much more in the States it's much more uh it's about practicality, right? You, right? you want as many Hindus to get to one place instead of having these separate separate little corners. Exactly. And and it's practicality, but I also think that we're going to see um, a shift in, in the next 10 or 15 years, really? the result of critical mass okay. uh, that you do see. So so in Minneapolis, uh -huh. as an example, you had the main Hindu temple uh, and you have all the deities. But now, you know, there's enough people who are um, Telugu speaking and yeah. so they may want to build something in the Bay Area, for instance, there's enough Gujaratis that they want to have a you know, Vaishnava Parivar, and it might just be uh, the the deity or the murti will just be Srinathji. So, yeah. you know, if you have enough, Swami Narayan is another example, yeah. you know, yeah. where, so I do feel that as the prosperity of the community grows and there's enough critical mass where, you know, enough people can come together and say, hey, we do need this particular uh, temple and, and not necessarily the pan temple, then, you know, we are seeing that happening. So how do you feel about that, though? Uh, <laughs> personally, I, you know, 
I think it's just, I don't really have an opinion about it. I think it's just, that's just the way communities grow and change and evolve right. over time, you know? Practicality also leads to a point where a building can't sustain the number of people that are in a community. So if you're meeting the need, but at the same time, there was kind of a community feel when there was yeah. only one, and it was likely that you were going to meet people um, at that one temple. And we haven't even talked about Caribbean temples no. that are part of the Hindu escape. Yeah. I, I personally really enjoy going to those because at least the ones that I have, I, I have attended uh, uh, Guyanese or Trinidadi Temple in Florida, mm -hmm. in Minnesota, um, and in New York. And they oftentimes, it's interesting to see what Hinduism looks like five, six generations out. It's right. just a congregation style, but I, I like that where there's a sense of community where everyone comes together, you sit down for satsang, you have a lecture, yeah. you sing some bhajans, you might do Hanuman Chalisa together and then end with Aarti and eat together. Um, there is a sense of community that's that's developed as a result of that kind of congregational style where some of the larger temples now, um, sometimes when they're so big, it almost feels like it's kind of like sitting at a restaurant at, versus going to a food court, <laughs> which is a really yeah. analogy maybe, and I don't mean to offend anyone with it, but you know, sometimes there's there's a counter, you pay your $21 or whatever it is for Archana, and then you go, but there's not necessarily or always um, ongoing programming that brings everyone that's under one yeah. roof together. Well, well I, I mean, the one thing I, I liked, uh, at least about the, the current way that temples are set up in the U.S. is, like, last year we went for Durga Puja and um, Navratri, you know, they do Chandi Homa for nine days. So we tried to go, me and Ratchet went, for, like, two or three times to, to participate. And... Because of that, we were able to meet people from diverse backgrounds and and uh, both both Desi and non Desi that are part of part mm -hmm. of the mixture. And it was that to me is so cool because you might have someone from the Vishnu Temple come down to or to the to this area and they see the Chandni home going on that they would never been exposed to. And I think that 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 exposure is so important which which you you would get in india just by the nature of living in india right you right. go from one place to another in the u.s you won't get that if you if you had like a temple that was just like say for just for krishna you're not and you that's the only temple you go to you don't get exposure to anything shaivite or ganesha or 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 shakta or anything and i think that's in, in, in the U.S., one of the problems that I see is having these siloed kind of communities, also based on linguistic groups, is that you end up only hanging out with that linguistic group. And and it becomes very cliquish to me um, in some sense. And, and I get it in India, uh, for right or wrong reason, the breaking down the states into linguistic is a problem, and I also think, just because I think historically speaking, no, no, uh, no, Raja or or kingdom was broken up linguistically, right? They had to deal with it, and now our identities are so based on our linguistic um, core. And and you see this problem arise in South India in, in Tamil Nadu about being Tamil and Dravidian and this versus right. Uh, and, and and these are problems that people were seeing even with Telangana versus I don't know. I, I think these divisions within our community are more problematic when we don't have. The, the net of of our like our larger Hindu tradition to keep us grounded. Well, I, I do I do think that that is that is the unifying thread is that right. is that Hindu Hinduness Dharma is our ethos. Um, however, you want to define it. Uh, but I I do see beauty in the linguistic groups because each linguistic group also has a rich tradition of poetry, oh, of music, and and those things I fear for of losing as a result of English taking over. Sure. Um, and um, with uh, with people moving around everywhere, I mean, yeah. I have cause, or even the diaspora, I'm still fluent in Gujarati and my parents taught me how to read and write. Yeah. Reading and writing is at a kindergarten level though. <laughs> I love to like, you know, graduate to middle school at some point, but, um, but even in, in India, if you start in an English medium, yeah, you may not know how to read and write in your linguistic language um, 
past my level and I'm, right. I'm generation out. So, uh, you know, I, I hear your point about uh, language possibly being a source of division, uh, but but that's where I think, um, you know, our philosophy and all those things have such a value. Uh, no, absolutely. And, yeah. I mean, for me, like I growing up, uh, you know, like my dad's Canada, my mom's Tamil. So mm -hmm. in the house, we spoke, my, we learned Tamil first, and then I learned Kannada by listening to my parents speak to each other. My mom learned Kannada to speak to my dad because she was like, kind of like the brothers, my dad and his brothers are speaking Kannada. She's like, I want to learn what they're saying. And so she <laughs> learned Kannada. And all, and all the sister-in-laws learned Kannada. And all, because like, I think like 300, 400 years ago, my dad's side was Tamil. So they kept that Tamil tradition alive while in Karnataka. So they spoke but being in Bangalore, you learn you speak four or five languages anyway. So growing up, I spoke Kannada, Tamil, and then I later learned Hindi um, and the Sanskrit. My dad taught me from a young age. So I'm probably somewhere like uh, Sanskrit, probably like middle school, high school, maybe college. I don't know. I have to figure that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can... You're far ahead of me. That's on my punch list. Like once I'm a empty nester, which will happen kind of next year, uh, that I can no. take up uh, Sanskrit. <laughs> But, but my point is, like, our linguisticness remains with us because it's part of our core, right? At the end of the day, it's it's like, you know, whether I learned, you know, I would learn shlok uh, shlokas and samskritam and also learn, like, prabandams in Tamil or or the, the songs in Purandasa, Kanakadasa, and even Mirabai and, and Tukaram. So, like, it, it was lucky that I had this background where my, my, my family was kind of pan-India. So it was more about, like, it wasn't wasn't about linguisticness it was about hey let's learn about all these other peoples within the greater indian world because they all bring some sort of beauty to the canvas that that makes our life better right because there's this interaction and but I, what i've noticed is that that is that happened a lot more with our generation with our generation sure. but if you end up being siloed i think you might lose some of that sure well. absolutely absolutely but i do so for instance you know i I'm only fluent in Gujarati, but because of that, I understand Hindi and I can read Devnagri from what I know in Gujarati. Yeah. So, you know, especially for shlokas and things like that, where I want to get the pronunciation right, there might be English, but there's a T and you're like, well, is it a ta? Is it a ta? Is it a ta? <laughs> you know, and so going, you can still connect the dots. So Sanskrit also, could at least for some languages be in addition to in in addition to like Hindu philosophy or teachings, oh, or, yeah. you know, uh, precepts that Sanskrit too can be that. Uh, that yeah, and I agree, and I think it's uh, it's something that I, I you know I, I wish I hope in I mean this is something that maybe um, you know Hindu Ameri uh, American Foundation is partaking in is trying to make that more of like a, I don't know like brought into our, our temples and I, I know you don't do that per se but you have that that power uh and kind of influence where where we can actually do something of that nature to connect across mm -hmm. no absolutely absolutely i mean one of the things if we're talking about temples and and participation i mean in yeah. some sense though um while we have a growth in temples yeah. every temple and this is not just temples, but I think other faith communities have the same challenges, um, diminishing number of people coming, right? Yes. Yeah. So the challenge I think for temples in the United States are, okay, we have a constant flow of, of an immigrant generation right. that, you know, from India has a temple as part of a central part of their lives and they're attending and they're maybe supporting, but then what's happening to the next generation? Yeah. Are yeah. they showing up? Um, and I think it, it, it depends um, on the temple and the community and the, the programming that they have. But the one thing that I have seen where temples have been successful in ensuring that, you know, subsequent generations are coming is one, education mm -hmm. and providing quality education on the tradition and then service. If, yeah. if some sort of component that then takes those teachings and translates them to, well, what does this really mean for you in terms right. of how you treat other people or how you serve your community or how, how you might treat the environment? 
if you can connect the dots successfully, whether it's at the familial level sure. or community level through a temple, um, I think there's some there's some opportunities there for the temples who have not incorporated those types of things. Um, so let me ask you on this. Um, I don't know if you guys have done this kind of work, but are, is there a drop in from the immigrant population to, I guess, I mean, our ABCD kind of uh, like, I guess, uh, population that's grown up in the U.S. Has there been a drop in temple uh, attendance? So, or? so my experience is anecdotal. Okay. Uh, you know, in that I don't necessarily find my cohort yeah. in large numbers um, at the temples. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's super anecdotal, but. Uh, Kathy Joshi, who's a, um, she studies this, she's a PhD in education and something else. She's a PhD, but, and I can't remember exactly the topic, so I don't want to be quoted on that, but yeah. she actually has written a book on this and she followed generational trends. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I remember of her findings, she was finding kind of a drop off yeah. in that even if, someone had gone to say a Balvihar or a yeah. temple as a child with their parents, the likelihood of them continuing um, dropped. Right. And there were a variety of reasons. One sure. is comfort that you might, uh, you might have learned, y you know, certain aspects of the tradition, but then when it comes to just that person going in on their own, there might be a level of intimidation. There might be a level of not feeling connected to the community. Yeah. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, our temples are going to have to evolve to meet those changing needs. If they stay as they are, there will be a segment whose needs are met. Right. But I think there's there's also other segments um, whose needs may not necessarily uh, be being met right now, and there's opportunity there. You know, it's I, I will put I I will say this. I think so. There's a temple in in. Southern California in Norwalk. It's called Sanatha Dharam Temple. Um, I don't know. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, it, it. It's right next to the. It's right next to the Swaminarayan Temple. And the one thing I think they do a really good job about actually is um, during Navratri. Um, and actually, even when I was in college, they would hold garbas, right? They would hold garbas at the temple itself. They have a separate location where the garba was, but it's part of the temple pre temple premises. And I think and and there was a good. Um, uh, uh, two big Gujarati communities in the area, the Bhaktas, and I think the uh, certain Patels were use that as their home temple. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that built, I guess, uh, links and anchors within the community to the temple. So that temple, like sponsorship or uh, what is it, attendance hasn't really dropped, what I've noticed. But somewhere, some, someplace like the Malibu temple, um, the attendance I could tell has dropped, or it's primarily like Im the immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, just because I don't think they do as much in terms of uh, the cultural programs or connecting, right? And and that's a problem I think that, that other that's another have. that's another way in which you can continue to draw people, right? Yeah. Is are those celebrations, the festivals, um, through Garba or through Diwali programs yeah. or celebration of Holi? And that's also those are also good opportunities to educate the public, yeah, uh, the broader public about Hinduism. Um, that and so so for instance the hindu american foundation has released lesson plans that in in some way what the temples are doing we see um our i guess place in maybe bridging any gap there is between what we are doing for our community and serving our needs internally right. with getting greater appreciation from from our neighbors and from the mainstream about what we're doing and for them to not just appreciate, but also, I mean, you have to understand in order to appreciate. So improving that understanding. Right. Um, so again, it's, a, it's kind of a tangent. So I also, I mean, I know you're a lawyer too. Um, yeah. Did you ever had an opportunity to practice or? I, or did. That... I did. So, you know, after I, I went into law school wanting to do public service. Mm. So my first job out of law school was with legal aid. And okay. so, was a homeless advocate and I worked um, essentially to provide um, benefits and representation to victims of domestic violence, to veterans and to other people who um, were facing homelessness. So that was my first 
a job straight out of college or law school. And then um, and so, one yeah, step. Okay. Uh, can I ask you, did that drive to help uh, in, I mean, indigenous populations, did that come from your, your, your Hindu practice or Hindu, or was it something that was separate? I mean, it, it, cause I think it's important to, to try to understand how, uh, you know, I, I don't, yeah, I mean, I suppose I, I've never really thought about, I, I grew up with stories of service yeah. from a very young age, yeah. right? So whether it's the story of Shravan and then the way that he, serves his parents um or um I, i'm trying to think of any other story even if it was you know stories of mahatma gandhi and in the way that he served the country right. or any other um you know either his historical figure of modern times or from our scriptures there is a strong um message of of trying to help other people right and, and so in some sense, maybe at a, at a very um, subconscious level, that value was being instilled. Uh, my um, my grandfather on my mother's side was a freedom fighter. Right. And uh, so even within the family, when there's stories of, of service, yeah. you just hear that they're spoken about in very respectful terms. And, and so even if it's not like... This is why we need to serve, you know, right. that's not the message, but but you get the subtle cues. Um, and so certainly that was at that time, did I articulate it as well? All my fellow human beings are uh, fellow Atma. And I don't yeah. necessarily articulating it in that in those terms today. Do I see it that way? Probably. Uh, okay. because my own understanding of of the tradition and um, maybe it also being internalized um, mm -hmm. more through different practices. Um, I could say that today, but back then, I think it was just, look, doing good for other people is the right thing to do. It's what our family right. does. It's how our, you know, even little things like if my parents saw another family, Indian family at the Indian grocery store, because back then you would recognize them. <laughs> you, know, you know, they would bring them over and immediately serve them. Or a random friend calls and says, hey, we have a friend who's visiting the San Francisco Bay Area. Can they come right. stay? So like, Atiti Devo Bhava, it's a very exactly. new concept. And so we saw it in living, breathing practice, but it, it wasn't like my parents would stop and say, this is what Atiti Devo Bhava means. Like, you know, right. it, wasn't that it was just the way we were and so i'm sure all those things kind of inspired that spark to want to give back and do something right right so you you were you did legal aid work and then did you just continue to do legal work or how did a uh, half start at that how point that happen? so so going back even actually during law school it, let me rewind back to okay. undergraduate i was very active in the indian student association on campus and uh, very quickly realized that that space, people were far more comfortable with cultural manifestations of, of our tradition. So we could have a Diwali program, but let's just be sure that it's not overtly religious, uh, right. you know, so that all the students who are there are comfortable, which, you know, for that's a whole different topic. But... <laughs> So, so, so that was kind of the, the, the environment. And so many of us felt that, well, how do we meet our spiritual needs? Um, mm -hmm. And so we organically started like a Gita reading and bhajan group um, where it was just a bunch of friends and slowly mm -hmm. started spreading and people were curious. So they started coming. So we were very informal where, you know, we would get together on a Friday night, um, sing some bhajans read a few verses from the um, Gita and then go out for pizza, maybe even go dancing. Yeah. You know, it was just part of, it became part of our, our college scene. When I got in law school or got to law school, a number of undergrads came to me and said, hey, we want to start a, a chapter of this group called the Hindu Student Council. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. other campuses were starting to start it. And I believe it was maybe the 50th anniversary of independence. Um, and so they were doing some sort of like pan- uh, country celebration. And so I think the students at University of Florida thought, okay, this is a good opportunity to start a chapter. So um, I did help 
um, them establish a chapter there. Interestingly enough, there had been some pushback um, from some professors on campus about starting Hindu Student Council because of associations with the VHPA yeah. and blah, blah, blah. So that was probably my first taste of the internal dynamics. Um, yeah. Hindus face um, in being able to have kind of a, a, a an assertive or even a more public uh, presence um, as Hindus. Um, then, you know, fast forward to where I was a newlywed. Uh, my husband, Asim uh, Shukla, is also a co-founder. One of my law school classmates, Nikhil Joshi, along with Mikhar <laughs> Megani, who we didn't know at the time, all of us. Um, so Nikhil, Asim, and I were starting to write letters to the editor and really kind of tapping into um, some of the biases that we were seeing in the media. Meanwhile, Mihir is uh, kind of doing the same sort of thing on his own. Um, at that time, um, I had shifted into immigration law only because it allowed me to work from home and we had just started a family. <laughs> so it was purely practical, uh, right. you know, although now in hindsight, it's actually helped us with our foundation sure. because I have familiarity with immigration. But um, right about that time, we got a call, Asim got a call from me here saying, hey, listen, I'm trying to pull together like-minded people because there's, I feel, a void that needs to be met. And that is having an organization that ultimately will be built into an institution that serves the needs of not only Hindus here at home and not just in India, but globally. Yeah. And, and so, and he said, but the thing that I'm interested in doing is I've been having a lot of conversations with Muslim groups, with uh, Jewish groups mm -hmm. and Christian groups. And the key to their success has been professionalizing. So having a professionalized model. And so we we took the bait, um, you know, as he here probably got a two for one deal or maybe a three for one deal with us because he initially called a seam. I said, I want in. And then yeah. Nick Hill Joshi in as well. And there were a couple <laughs> of others. And and so we just kind of started really very idealistic. Why yeah. I would say now in hindsight, like, what are we thinking? Um, but, uh, you know, it took a handful of donors who we used to give this, I think back, and it's kind of funny. We had almost like a 45 slide deck <laughs> explaining what the Hindu American Foundation what we envisioned it to be and what right. we were to do, right. having done nothing. But I think that there were a few, you know, angel donors in the community who said, here is this next generation wanting to fill a space that we haven't yet. They right. saw the value and, and 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 they trusted us. And and from there, you know, within two or three years, we were able to hire our first staff member. So wow. our work got to a point basically where I could no longer do my day job and also help with, with HAF and everyone else had their day jobs as well. But um, in some sense, the degrees that I pursued really, um, had I not known HAF, I would have applied to HAF anyways. I have a, <laughs> right, I have a bachelor's degree in religion, yeah. I have a law degree. Uh, and so um, it worked out perfectly, um, and and I haven't looked back. I just celebrated 11 years on staff, though I'm a co-founder. Wow. So HAF right. is 16 years old, but I didn't join uh, staff formally. I was actually the third or fourth staff member to join. So what was the first issue you guys took up when you guys started? So um, do you I remember. Think, I mean. Yeah, I do remember. So there were two issues um, that. Um, we took on and, and they were kind of, I don't want, they may not have been back to back, mm -hmm. but the first was the Paul Courtright issue. Uh, if you remember the Ganesha book. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to remember whether we even had a website or not. We may not have had a website back then. This was 2003. Well, 2003, we incorporated, so maybe 2004, 2005, where, um, we started writing letters, and and that was probably the first kind of public um, uh, presence of HAF. And, yeah. and and we're talking about a very even um, infant web presence for anyone, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> 
I, mean, so, I just got I, out of law school at that point. So I, I, I this was dial up internet. I mean, that, yeah. that's what we're talking about. Everyone might have gotten the AOL disc. Well, I think I, 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 2005 were a little above that because I had just got out of, got out of law school. I think they had like very slow internet at that time, but it was still like it wasn't the dial up though. Well, so it, it would depend on you know we were we were still in residency, so we still had dial up because oh, okay. was a little bit more expensive, I think. But uh, but this is this was that kind of time. The second thing um, that brought us, I think, uh, into maybe the um, view of the larger Indian American community was filing a, a, a brief, an amicus brief to the U.S. Supreme Court. So it was kind of like go big or go go home kind of thing. And who filed it? Did you file it or or did yeah. you who drafted it? You drafted it? Well, so I was working very closely with. So this is it, it's kind of a funny story. It was just happenstance that I happened to be in the car when an NPR story came on talking about Van Orden versus Perry. And they sure. were interviewing Professor Erwin Shemarinsky, who's a um, expert in the field on Constitutional law, yeah. separation of church and state. So um, heard the story and I thought, wow, this would be kind of cool. You know, a, an American issue in which there's a Hindu voice called up Professor Shemarinsky and said, I'm from the Hindu American Foundation. I don't even know if I'd ever actually even articulated it that way. And he said, well, tell you what, there's a national calling call, conference call that the Americans United for Separation of Church and State and the ACLU and a number of Anti-Defamation League and a number of other advocacy groups are joining in on. So day later, I'm on this call and I said, well, I'm here from HAF and we'd love to file a brief, but I don't know the first thing about it. I mean, I had written a brief for moot court. That's right. We all <laughs> I, did. Yeah, it counts um, or is the requisite amount of experience to know. So I think it was um, Americans United for Separation of Church and State who started putting out feelers for a um, for a firm that would help us pro bono. Meanwhile, I end up talking to my brother-in-law, who was a patent attorney, Mm -hmm. um, Goodwin Proctor, and he said, hey, we have folks who might be interested. So they took it up. And so we had a pro bono firm and I worked very closely with developing the arguments. And and then before you know it, you know, I went from writing a moot court amicus brief <laughs> to straight to the Supreme Court, which is a pretty cool for. for That's pretty week. awesome. <laughs> Did you ever get the opportunity to appear? No, I mean, I attended the oral argument. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that was actually my first time in the Supreme Court, which was... I have not was, been yet. Yeah, you should. And visit our offices in Washington, D.C. as well. <laughs> uh, but after filing that brief, it was really interesting to see what the community reaction was. Yeah, and there yeah. we, I think, identified another opportunity um, for HAF and, and what our mandate should include. And that is educating our own community about our rights and so one of the letters to the editor was, you know, America is a Christian country. Why are we rocking the boat? We've been welcomed here. Yeah. So, you know, I think that also maybe reflects a generational difference um, for those of us born and raised here. We don't feel like guests in this country. Yeah. We are American, right? right? And so, you know, uh, filing an amicus brief or, you know, I don't know, filing litigation or, or participating in a public process is very much a part of being an American. So um, so that was a nice uh, wake up call in in the sense of, oh, OK, you know, we did this, but right. the community might be somewhere else on it. So um, that kind of, I guess, sparked your your drive to do education. And so what have you done in terms of, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, yeah. but what are your, your major like uh, programs or I guess a process, uh, not process, but programs that you've done since then to really do education? And, and, and can, can you give us kind of a scope on that? Sure. So I think we look at education in very broad terms. It, okay. it is trying to both shape and change the understanding of both Hinduism and Hindus. Okay. So that's a very, very lofty goal. Yeah. Um, and 
even the uh, platform or, or the, the spaces in which we see educational opportunity is a wide spectrum. It starts mm -hmm. from probably the earliest introduction of Hinduism to the average American, which is any time between K through 12. Mm -hmm. Then it is in college, once again, where you might be introduced um, to, uh, to Hinduism or to issues related to Hindus. Right. And then, of course, the most prolific, which is the media, uh, right. newspapers, blogs, and um, even even entertainment. So that's kind of the um, landscape, I guess, with right. within which we work. Uh, I'll just focus maybe primarily on on K through twelve education. Our approach in K through twelve education, um, first of all, it was a priority that I think we identified from the get go, only because all of us or, or the majority of the co-founders were born and raised in the United States and went through school, the schools here. And each one of us had faced the stereotypes um, that emanated from either our social studies textbooks yeah. or from entertainment, right? So whether it was Temple of Doom um, or, or it was the way in which um, Hinduism was taught in ninth grade or sixth grade, so, all those things lent to our understanding or recognizing the need to do something about the way Hinduism was understood and how it was being taught. Right. So uh, our, our education work, I would say, is both responsive as well mm -hmm. as proactive. The responsive part of it is participating in, in school pro, uh, or state board processes. So states like California, Texas, Virginia have what's called a public process in which they, uh, you know, the school board decides here are the topics we're going to teach um, right. in social studies and this is how we're going to teach it so for hinduism you have to hit these five points uh, and so the problem for hinduism is that those five points are flawed yes when you get to those if, if the foundation is flawed then everything coming from it is going to be flawed right uh, so in california you know one of the first one is study the caste system it just starts right. off right there it doesn't even talk about uh oh and then uh study the um Aryan invasion and yep. then, you know i study the role of women that's a little bit more benign but then when you see how it ends up you know in the frameworks or in the content it's not so great and maybe maybe they might have something about karma or the basic beliefs but they don't outline those so it leaves right. a lot of room for um, first of all, just getting things inaccurately. Right. Second, getting things superficially, if they get it even right. And right. third, conflating a lot of social practices or sociological and um, anthropological um, topics or themes that then get conflated with what should really just be like philosophy and theology. Right. Uh, now, if, if the approach... For that, because the academic study of religion does do that. It is interdisciplinary in that it brings sometimes history, anthropology, psychology, right. number of, you know, whole slew of different topics. If all the other traditions were approached in that same way, uh, so that Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism were all taught through that same approach, and there would not be a problem, but they're not. So, yeah. so the responsive at part of our work is that so the state board says okay here are what we're going to require textbook publishers to write about these topics the public has an opportunity to submit comments that okay this is accurate this you know is inaccurate this is how you could present it better sure. or here are the topics you're missing so we participate in that public process and um there have been times where we sued the state because they weren't following their own public process um, there are times where they're following their public process, but the problem is that you're still at, um, you're beholden to, you know, whatever it is, 15 state board members yeah. or whatever the case may be, uh, so that you don't have 100% um, control over what the end product is going to be. So it has its limitations, but it's still important that you be there. Um, the, the more proactive aspect of our work is creating content. 
and right. then distributing that content to educators. Because what we have found in our day-to-day -day conversations with teachers or school administrators is that they want to get things right. They right. see that their role in society as a whole is preparing the next generation. And especially right. now, it's preparing the next generation for a globalized world. Uh, they are going to be working with, you know, their their uh, cohorts in Bangalore or yeah. in somewhere in China. So there needs to be understanding for companies to be able to function, for countries to get along, for people and neighbors, especially in America, where we're a diverse, pluralistic, and multi-ethnic, multinational country. Right. You need to be able to understand your neighbors. So in our content creation, we have our Hinduism 101 program that's available on our website. Mm -hmm. And it's that's www.hafsite.org for anyone who's interested. But there we provide content on a variety of topics and they take a deep dive. They're probably written for, you know, a ninth grade and up level. And we have future plans of kind of creating more, um, you know, age appropriate materials for say a sixth grade class. Sure. Um, and then also creating lesson plans so that a teacher can, first of all, get the background information from the primer and get their own understanding of a topic and then be able to teach it. We've trained teachers directly at the district, at a school, at a classroom level, mm -hmm. at a school level, at a district level, and at the state level. So we participate in social studies conferences where we will go and present and give a, a basic training to 30 teachers at a time. And so over the past couple of years, we've been able to train about 4,000 teachers. And um, so they, um, a relationship is built then where they sure. get the initial training. Some, some of the comments that we've gotten at these trainings are that, wow, I had no idea I was teaching Hinduism incorrectly for all these years. Right. The cumulative effect of going directly to even just one teacher, one teacher has maybe 20 to 30 students in their class. And then they might teach, if it's a social studies teacher, they might be teaching two or three additional classes, right? Sure. So that's 90 students per one teacher. Right. Then apply that cumulatively over that teacher's career. Because it's not like you get a training and you apply it that year and right. then you forget everything you learned. So we really felt that this was an investment that was necessary. And um, we were looking to scale it because right. it's so important because there's a demand for good information and there's a concern for getting it right. Um, so then it's just that, and, and we have good content that we've actually worked with academic scholars. We've had um, lay practitioners mm -hmm. from different sampradayas looking at it. So even our materials, I would say, are constantly evolving because right. it's, it's a huge onerous task and responsibility to, um, to try to encapsulate the breadth and depth of our tradition and communicate it away to a non-Hindu audience so that they can actually make some sense of it. You know, sense of it, exactly. No, it, it, and so I have a comment and then I have a couple questions for you. Yes. Um, so I, I think you're right. And one of the things I think is so difficult is that we're, and this I, I take from Bala Gangadhar's position um, that, that our tradition isn't a religion. It's not like in, in a way that they talk about religion, it's difficult to talk about anything connected to what is called Hinduism because we don't have the same central tenets and central ideas and this and that. It, it all depends on which school you're looking at, right? So it's so difficult for for anybody. And, and the task that you're taking is monumental, but it's very laudable that you're trying to present something, I guess what the mainstream of many what Hindus would believe in believe in in the sense of how what they buy into um but it's so difficult right like wh oh, yeah. what are you going to teach are you going to teach samkhya which or mimamsa or any of these things that may not have anything in common but they have a certain ethos that, that we talked about earlier that kind of connects them right and that's difficult to kind of put that into like five points um so yeah go ahead so i was just going to say that well one just on classifying us as a religion. I think it's important to do so only okay. because a lot of the legal frameworks um, I, I that that. built, right? So whether it's human rights or civil rights or discrimination right, right, right. Um, or all those things. So yeah. I, I think if, if we could, it would just be a religion plus, right? Yeah. <laughs> In terms of, and I, and I think many other faith communities would 
say the same thing. For instance, you know, if you talk to Muslims, they're going to say, yes, it's a way of life for them because it, it you know, the tradition or, or their, their teachings inform how they might eat, how they might pray, how their day is structured. Now, we don't necessarily have all that. For some Hindus, it is. Yeah. Uh, but what we have learned, though, so one is just the embracing of both, not just the word religion, but also the word Hindu, because we get a lot of pushback on that. Yeah. Why do the Sanatan Dharma American yeah. tradition? Well, one, because the average American may not hear Sanatan and they might hear Satan or they might hear something else that's going to yeah. really shut them off. Um, yeah. But second, look, it's a word that's used to describe us, but we've never, if we don't own it, and then we relinquish the right and the responsibility to define it, right? So I, I, I think. I think you're totally right. Like we have to accept the term. And I had a, a dialogue with even Sean where I have issues with the term, but I accept it. Right. Like right. I, I, I it, and I agree with you from a perspective at a, at a legal level that we have to define ourselves in a religion just because the framework of most legal systems in the world is built on the, uh, in some sense, Judeo Christian, later Anglican, and, and then the system that requires that we have that distinction. Right. But, from a conceptual level, I I tend to be we we're not a religion. We are opposite of what these religions are because the term religion has have to have a set a set of beliefs, a founder, a book, a this and that. None of those things we have. So we're we are kind of the anti-religion religion, if you want to call it. Sure, but there is there are uh, there are shared concepts. I would say. In, and and when I say share concepts, and I had I had a conversation with Hushal about this in terms of like say if you included it, you know, he has a definition, and I said even if you include the Vedas in there, yeah, uh, the traditions you're talking about are, are the Vedas are there, and it's either accepting them or rejecting them, but there's still certain concepts that come from there, like so Dharma, yeah, right, Karma. Now how you interpret that is is different so now i don't know that you can say that the, i don't like to use the word beliefs for those things right, right. they're still their their concepts their philosophies so i do think that there are there is that thread that that we could possibly find some semblance uh, look how many couching words i'm using some semblance yeah. of, of consensus there and I, because otherwise otherwise there is something that pulls us all together. You well, are right. So there is something, and well, what I, that exactly is. Maybe that's that's what Hinduism. And, and this is and what I call it's like this. What I consider is a stream of consciousness that so it's varied, but it's like the stream. There's there's outlets. Like for example, like even the term Astika and Nastika is not about belief in the Vedas. It's actually, the term itself is about the acceptance of the divinity of the Vedas. So even Buddhists yeah. will, will accept, for example, the Vedas as long as it agrees with their their, uh, uh, their, their thought process. But they don't expect, they don't accept the apolishaya nature of the Vedas, right? Sure, so which sure. is, so I, in I that sense, it's the same not like, of, or whatever the word you want to use. Right. Uh, so it's is. not an issue of, of oh, th th we reject this book. No, it's just right. we don't accept it in this context. We so, accept yeah. Right. So there's non-exclusivism. Right. right. There's there's something that's there. There's there's pluralism. Right. Um, which you know both of those are maybe two sides of the same coin. And then there's there's a quest for truth. Right. Uh, uh, there's uh, there's freedom. I mean, there's a lot of things now, and maybe all those are what make up dharma. I don't know. That's that's a whole intellectual conversation. You can go down that road, but. But maybe maybe we save that for another conversation. But um, I, I do think what we have learned over the years to get the depth and breadth is learn couching terms, right? And maybe that's where a legal thing comes, where some Hindus believe this, others believe this, or some Hindus practice it this way, others reject this. So ensuring, and, and we've had a lot of people call out, interestingly enough, um, I think that a lot of the understanding of Hinduism, largely, has a Advaita bias. Yes, 100%. Right? So, yeah. so the people we hear from most are Advaitas. Hey, yeah. why did you write it this way, right? And we're, we're like, you're right. Let's fix it. So that's what I mean when I say that our, our 
our content is ever evolving. Recently with my conversation with Kushal on, on <laughs> atheism, he's opened my eyes to something that we probably need to incorporate and, and study more so that people understand. I mean, it, it's, it's it, and, and this is what I'm saying is it's like the work you're doing is so laudable in this sense because what you're trying to do is take something that's so complex and so diverse and plural and, <laughs> and try to put it into kind of a packaging that where you can explain some stuff but kind of leave it open-ended at the backside where you're conveying some truth that allows your teacher or or your the person that's not acquainted with the tradition or traditions to be like, oh, wow, this is something I never thought about. And that's it's a way for me to think about it, but also to give them that sense is, but this is only a kernel, right? It's, it's like yeah, having yeah, a little absolutely. taste, right? And, and, that, and that's tough to do, yeah. especially okay. when you don't have the time for – for like hours to sit around to, to talk about this stuff. Completely agreed. And so, you know, these teacher trainings um, have been a good opportunity for that, where we, after we build a relationship, there might be that preliminary. It's like the 30,000 foot view yeah. of Hinduism. But there are a lot of teachers who come back and say, well, what next? Yeah. What more do you have, right? So we have had a good partnership with, um, like the Sri Shiva Vishnu Temple um, in the DC metro area, where we will host like an intensive for a weekend, and okay. teachers are coming in. So in it, so that's where we take a deeper dive into where maybe they had a Hinduism basics training. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper into what dharma might possibly mean or what right. karma samsar moksha means. And guess what? We're in a temple, so now let's go see what worship looks like. Right. Let's have lunch to see what does a vegetarian meal look like. And right. so there are ways in which you can kind of connect the abstract with the day to day sure. to give people that understanding or let them know that, hey, there's a, you know, there's a Garba celebration or there's a right. Diva program and encouraging families to take their tradition into the school. That's where our toolkits have been really valuable. We have a Diwali toolkit. Um, we released a um, holy toolkit this year in which um, either a teacher can take it and run with it or parents can take it into their classrooms and run with it. And um, we're really um, fortunate. Our director of education, um, she's the second one who's fulfilled this post. Uh, her expertise is in curriculum development. So right. we've been really fortunate to have brought in that kind of talent and that's a, that's another i think um it's a it's another milestone for haf in that thanks to community support we've been able to actually uh make good on our promise to have a professionalized model right. but you know first it was a lot of folks who were we were kind of either co-founders we started as volunteers and became staff but now we're in a position where we are hiring and, and people are coming to us wanting to work for HAF. They don't right. see it like this big risky factor. There's an opportunity to have a career in which you can serve the community, educate the public, and and really enjoy what you do on a right, daily right. basis. No, which is awesome. Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, I am going to take it a little bit negative direction. Because sure. It's not negative, but it's a, it's a negative thing for what Hindus had to deal with. So in your initial part, you talked about your your first, your like you had your proactive, and then you had your your first section, which is your your on your education side, kind of dealing with what the textbooks and so on, right? So this goes back to like 2005 when you first started the the textbook uh, issue with California. I think uh, you guys were kind of spearheading that, right? So there were a lot of groups on the ground, uh, okay. and and honestly, we got involved once the process started going south. Okay. So, you know, there was, um, I believe, Hindu Education Foundation and okay. um, Vedic Education Foundation. I think they're associated with Barsana Dham. Oh, I think their name has changed now, but from Austin, Texas, right? So those okay. are kind of the two um, primary groups who were submitting comments um, and edits and suggestions. So, so, so before we get into, can you kind of explain, start with that issue? Because I want to talk, I want to explain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, what the state board does um, mm -hmm. or the curriculum 
frameworks committee. I won't get in too much into the weeds on that. Yeah. What they do is they put out for public display uh, drafts. Mm -hmm. It can either be drafts of frameworks, which are basically very skeletal outlines of what will be covered. Right. Or it can be textbook content. And, and that is a little bit more detailed on this is how we're going to teach the things that are on our frameworks or the outline. Um, even more skeletal than frameworks are content standards. The okay. content standards in California were actually ad adopted by the state legislature. And it would take an act, another act of the state legislature to change the content standards. Wow. So remember when I went back to saying that when you have flawed premises, yeah, I, those are the content standards. Everything else flowing from it is always going to be a little bit rotten. And that's the problem in California. So how did they pick the five and how was that passed into law? I mean, who makes that decision? So we're talking about content standards for Hinduism that were adopted, I want to say, either late 80s or early 90s. So they were, you know, maybe they brought together a panel of experts, but we know the state of the academic study of Hinduism. Yeah. Or many of your listeners may. Uh, so you can only imagine. Only today are we starting to see these emerging voices of, of uh, scholars um, who are committed to reflecting the tradition with without the lens of, you know, indol like traditional Indology or Marxism, right? So, yeah. um, you know, those things probably largely or, or Freudian thought, which Freudian comes from. Thought. Oh, of course. How can I forget my favorite? Um, so, um, so that that cannot be changed without a bill or, or yeah. you know, some legislation to change that. We actually, in terms of, and this kind of maybe goes a little bit into our policy work. Mm -hmm. But we actually successfully worked with a coalition, secular, uh, faith-based, a very diverse coalition, to um, advocate for a bill that would that called for the revision of the content standards, and for whatever political maneuverings or whatever the the governor vetoed it. That was a couple of years ago. The information is on our our website. Right. So there have been efforts to change the content standards but it's it's a, a little bit more of a steep climb because it gets you know politics and right because and all that sort of stuff involved uh so so that's how the the school textbook stuff happens right that these content or sorry these frameworks or the textbook uh content is put out for the public to make comments on in 2005 these uh community groups had successfully gotten a number of edits and corrections accepted. Uh, to take it just one step back in terms of what's the overall problem with the way in mm -hmm. which India and Hinduism are covered. Um, one is um, just the inaccuracies, just basic inaccuracies, yeah. whether it's in captions or, or in the way that things have been defined. Second is uh, the way in which images are selected. So there are a lot of images that I think uh, validate certain stereotypes. So when you're in the India or Hinduism section, you'll see a lot of, you know, pictures of poverty. Yeah. Or, you know, there, there's a classic picture of a woman who's collecting garbage or a cow eating from a pile of, you know, garbage. So contrast that with, say, the, the chapters on Judaism where they show like a family sitting together for Seder dinner um, or there's like beautiful Renaissance painting yeah. Moses, uh, you know, so uh, you see a real dichotomy just in the visuals and pictures say a thousand words. Like if you're a kid, you're and if you're not, yeah. reading, you're just looking at pictures. Right. So that's that's just kind of a general problem with the way in which Hinduism is presented then I would say the number one issue is the conflation of caste-based discrimination and Hinduism. Yeah. Uh, this, this particular topic takes up sometimes half of a unit on, on Hinduism, which maybe you're lucky if it's six to 10 pages. Right. So there's a disproportionate focus on social practice. Now, this is not to 
whitewash history or deny the fact that caste-based discrimination is a reality in South Asia. Sure. Uh, but where, where we have sought to bring nuance and context to this particular topic is to, first of all, make a distinction between Varna and Jati. Sure. Uh, Varna being a philosophical concept and, and actually being the underlying uh, conceptual framework to personality types, which is the heart of a lot of psychology today. Sure. Uh, so that's one thing. And then Jati, which were the, uh, the social units that, that evolved in Indian society. So that's one thing making that distinction. The second is to turn to basic Hindu teachings about the divinity of, of all creation and all people. Um, and so that being kind of an underlying, you know, understanding Vasudeva Kutumbakam or, you know, each person having an Atma that yeah. is either a reflection of the divine or the divine itself, depending on what school of thought you're coming from. Um, so that's a second fa uh, point. The third is the evolution of the system. That sure. You cannot uh, describe it as this rigid system when history tells us that it evolved, it, you know, that um, that you, you saw different jati groups changing um, their professions and then thereby changing their overall association because there was at some point some sort of not conflation but association that occurred between the jatis and the four major varnas because you have thousands of jatis and only yeah. a varna. So, trying to bring that sort of level of detail in in there but but even then you should be talking about caste if you want in a larger chapter on india perhaps but not necessarily when you're just covering hinduism right right in the same way that you're going to cover slavery or conquests um in a historical context but you're not going to teach those things as fundamental integral christian teachings or or jewish teachings or muslim sure. teachings. so that's another challenge in the way hinduism is taught uh the third would be the role of women mm -hmm. in in some books it, there were just blanket statements of in hinduism women are inferior to men <laughs> okay uh let's talk about navratri let's talk about shakti let's oh. I mean, Let's even, talk about the pillar of many households. Let's talk about matriarchal societies in Kerala. Like, come on, like seriously. I, I mean, it's 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 crazy to me because like one of the first things I learned was Satyam Mata Pita Gnanam Dadmam Prata. Right, the first thing that's the the truth is mother. Right, this is like, and then second to truth is knowledge, which is father. And it, it's, it's idea is, and, and this is a crazy. The women are foundational. Like even in our tradition, like. A, a man is not considered complete until he's married, and that when he is married, he can't do any of his rights without his wife. It, it's 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 literally requires them to be together. Like men and women have to be together. Right. So the, when you when you simplify that, now contrast that to yeah. the the description of women in Islam, for instance. Yeah. That Islam conferred onto women more rights than the pre-Islamic society. I mean, you know, there's, it's almost somersaulting to say, well, here are the positive things that yeah. women receive from the tradition, while you have one simple statement without even acknowledging out of all the major religions that are taught yeah. in, in, in middle school. We're the only ones that worship the women. The only one <laughs> that acknowledges the feminine divine. Yeah. And you have no mention of that. So right. that's, that's another area that's deeply, deeply problematic. And then going back to kind of the inaccuracies, sometimes a chapter on Hinduism may not even, like they'll have dharma, but dharma is somehow defined as only caste duty and nothing else, you know? So you don't hear about concepts of like ahimsa. Ahimsa might come up actually in the chapter on Buddhism. Yeah. So then you have a, then that last kind of, theme in which uh, inaccuracy or or un lack of parity creates, yeah. is that Buddhism is somehow, it's taught as being an improvement. Oh, I'll see Hinduism with all these problems with their women and their caste problem and all that. Well, now Buddhism came around and yeah. it sought to improve all the bad stuff right. 
Um, and so it was like, you know, a reform movement. Or was it? Possibly. No, no but, it wasn't. You know what I mean? The point is that you could make that argument, but a lot of things. Can you imagine a school textbook that said, here's Judaism, but they had all this stuff wrong with it. So that's why Christianity came about. But then Christianity also had all this stuff wrong about it. And that's where Islam came in. Like you would never see that sort of presentation. You would have said, and I mean, you can't also, sorry, Sikhism is also oftentimes presented that way. You know, I, but, but this is the problem is, again, I mean, when you go back to the, the actual sources and, and, and even the, the, the hit, the, the works from that time period, it's never a sense of Buddhism wasn't a reform. It was another monastic path. I mean, sure. it's, 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 like most Buddhists and, and this, any scholar of Buddhists will tell you would, be every day at home practicing Vedic world. They would do yajnas. They would kept their caste or jati or varna. They kept it. They didn't discard it. That's what they. They would just follow that when it became to the most monastic path. Because Buddhism is a monastic path, just like Jainism is. It's. A, it, I mean, and, and this is what the textbook should. I mean, they should say a lot of things. But there's there is Shramana path, which is different from the Brahmana path, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the path. With most people should follow, and the Shamana paths, which Jainism, Buddhism, were were basically meant to be monastic paths. It wasn't reform; it was a way to deal with the world by discarding the world. But this goes back to colonial era narratives, right? right? right. And and so um, those colonial era narratives still largely inform the textbooks because they 100%. still largely inform the academic study of religion. What we're, what we're starting to do, right, is, is also those Marxist narratives, right? Yeah. Like when it comes to caste, it's almost a mishmash. Uh, I haven't seen Freudian, I guess because for K through 12, they have to keep it, you know, G. Yeah, but, that's uh, right. <laughs> but I have not, I, I, I'm definitely seeing, um, you know, more of those Marxist narratives. Yeah. That's also largely because of activist academics, um, South Asian activists um, slash academics who, so in California, that's what happened, right? You had community members who had, were beginning to see some success. At the 11th hour, uh -huh. uh, academics wrote a letter, um, and I believe Michael Witzel from Harvard was the yeah, lead. Yeah. So, of course, he uh, abused Harvard letterhead. I don't know if you know that was allowed or not, but you know that's an entirely different story. But had co-signatories of kind of the I like to refer to them as the usual suspects. You're going to see all these signatures. Oh, come it's the up. Doniger, so right. Yeah. You're going to see the signatures come up um, when it you're dealing with political issues in India. You're actually going to see a lot of these signatures when they're trying to uh, join the um, BDS, the boycott di divest sanction. Uh, movement against Israel. Uh, yeah. So there's there's a definitive political ideology that drives um, these coalitions of academics. So that 11th hour letter comes in and all of a sudden the state board, of course, intimidated by Harvard letterhead and a bunch right. of professors who say they are experts in the field, slam on the brakes and right. start having these closed door meetings the difference with these closed door meetings was that while there was not necessarily a Hindu representative, um, they were allowing other faith communities to be at the table. Really? Um, yes. So during the deliberations on Hinduism, they had uh, Professor uh, Witzel and debating him, or I mean, it's horrible that this sort of stuff was being debated per se. And Michael yeah. Witzel doesn't even have expertise in history or in Hinduism, maybe Sanskrit so-called expertise, but um, and a professor, guy. yeah, and and um, Professor Shiva Bajpai, who has since passed away. Um, so you know, it was kind of a a, a duel. <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, like. Uh, but Professor Bajpai, um, you know, who's a remark was a remarkable scholar, um, was able to ensure that many of the edits remained unchallenged because. Right. The way in which Michael Witzel was opposing them was on a political basis, or oh, yeah, yeah. you know, and and you can find some of the, I believe, some of those transcripts are are available online. Uh, but that's when we stepped in, when the, right. when the process started getting unfair, and then we also submitted our own comments. Uh, but um, but that, I think, that lawsuit, you know, while people may debate whether it was 
I wouldn't say it was 100% victory because yeah. even though the court ruled that the process was flawed mm -hmm. uh, and the state board um, did, well, they didn't rule that either. They said the process was flawed and that the mm -hmm. state board did not uh, follow its own process. They did not require that the textbooks be republished and that the whole process be opened again. We're just from a practical standpoint, think about yeah. it. You're talking about millions of dollars that now the state yeah. is going to have to pay again because you're going to have to rewrite textbooks. So what that lawsuit succeeded in was that it forced the state board to adopt. There was actually a longstanding court case from a couple of years prior in which there was a standing order that the State Board of Education had to clean up its process. Because I think there was a pattern of this, of uh, working behind closed doors and things like that. And sure. so what our lawsuit did was finally made sure that the State Board followed even Their a process. Previous, previous order, order, and they created a more transparent process. Uh, it was also symbolic that, look, we are not a community that's gonna take things laying down. Right. Uh, uh, and so that's where I think um, litigation is a powerful tool. You may not get 100% of what you want, right. uh, but um, it's an incremental strategy uh, and you have to be in it for the long game in order to utilize it. So let me ask you then, um, this is just in California. Have the other states like Texas and you said Virginia, I think Florida, right? Mm -hmm. um, did they have uh, similar processes and or was it much easier for you to uh, engage with them? Um, so, uh, you know, we work with coalitions um, across across the country. Um, yeah. Other states have not been as contentious as California. California right. yeah. has also been um, kind of uh, ground zero for this South Asianist activism. Also. Okay. Right. So um, you have like Friends of South Asia and some of these other I don't even know if they're they were at least a, a loose group. They're not necessarily a registered organization, sure. I don't believe. But but this network of um, of organizations and oftentimes what this network basically is, is it's like the same five or six activist professors who create new acronyms they're very good at creating acronyms um, right. and create these organizations so that when there's a sign-on letter it looks like there's you know 40 yeah but 35 of them can be traced back to the same five activist professors so um i think that probably exaggerated it um in terms of of how contentious uh, mm -hmm. the process became now um, the challenge is a little bit different um, in that um, these professors have also partnered with um, Ambedkarite Dalit activists as well as Sikh activists and Muslim activists. So mm -hmm. they create a coalition. Um, but many of these professors have Hindu names. So they technically uh, can state that, oh, well, we're also um, here um, as Hindus. But if you look at most of their writings, they're they're not necessarily representing the interests of Hindus. In fact, um, during this last round of, of adoptions, one of their allies testified um, in in front of the state board and on the public record that um, Hinduism is a. It wasn't until he came to America, and I'm paraphrasing, that he realized what a evil social construct Hinduism is. So this is the sort of attitude. They they firmly believe that, um, you know, for some of the social grievances that, that legitimately exist, that for those social grievances to be addressed, Hinduism has to be um, annihilated. Are these guys scholars of religion or are they scholars of like Sanskrit or... Uh, usually, so this is where like um, it's like intersectionality hell. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, you have, um, you know, and, and not to say that there's not legitimate work in sure. these spheres, but yeah. we know that there's activist elements um, which uh, are not just within the Hindu and South Asian um, sphere, but in the larger uh, sphere uh, behind kind of the stifling of free exchange of ideas and speech yeah. 
college campuses. So you have gender studies, you might have South Asian studies. You had a lot of scholars of Islam weighing in on Hindu edits, but yeah. they were silent on edits for Islam. Right. What's right. your motivation there? You have to look back and ask. Uh, so, uh, and then there were even um, professors who had nothing to do with any of these humanities. Um, or liberal arts, there were science professors and things like that. So clearly they're coming from a political ideology because they have sure. nothing to do with um, with what we're doing. What we have been able to do, though, is that we understand the optics of, you know, when, when a state board, which is made of like administrators and volunteers yeah. and yeah. sometimes K through 12 educators, educators, when they come across like a, a letter that's written by, you know, on Harvard letterhead no less and with all these professor names with these phds um that there's a weight that comes with it but we have been able to build relationships with a number of scholars and i think you've probably talked to many of them yeah, uh, right. you know professor jeffrey long um professor ramdas lamb and um uh, professor anand rambachan and a number of others who are yeah. really respected in the field um professor uh, barbara mcgraw who teaches interfaith and, and a number of other things that they understand the challenges and they are committed to teaching um, or not teaching, but at least incorporating more emic understandings um, mm -hmm. or lived under, uh, you know, understandings of the tradition as a lived tradition. Um, and so we've been able to build relationships with them and they have come out to support, um, you know, accuracy and balance in the way Hinduism is taught. Right, and and that's 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 awesome that you're you're building this uh, team of people that uh, scholars that have not only are are objective and and come from diverse backgrounds, but have have either a lived experience or a deep knowledge of the history, of the text, and and the people uh, that are that are involved. Right, so I, I think it's uh, like you know to have that is um, nothing sh short of necessary, especially going forward. Right, and 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 this probably something that couldn't have been done like 20 years ago um, right. with people with having the courage to step out and talk about it and, and, and connect to a Hindu organization, to be honest. Right. And, and that's, that's the thing that, um, well, one, I, you know, oftentimes people will mistake, mistakenly assume that I think mistakenly assume that you have to be Hindu to be able to teach Hinduism no. accuracy. And I don't think that's, that's right. I think that if scholarship um, remains um, guided by intellectual curiosity and intellectual honesty and integrity, right. you can study any topic. Um, Absolutely. You know, so, so that I just want to put that out there. The second thing is that what we have found um, in our relationships with and conversations with a variety of academics is that there, uh, to use the words of the intersectionality <laughs> movement in some sense, there's not a safe space for teaching Hinduism um, in a respectful manner sometimes. There's not a safe space for publishing papers that reflect emic understandings of the tradition so that, you know, the major journals where, and, and you know, I know Rajiv Mohotra wrote about this long ago um, about like the cartel that you're not going to get invited to the uh, yeah. crowd panels or, you know, unless you tow to a particular narrative. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it, it's a, it's a complex issue that needs to be addressed. I think the, the easiest and most important way mm -hmm. is for more um, Hindus to certainly pursue the academic study of religion or or humanities or whatever, um, but also more students take those classes and take professors to task um, when, you know, because you might have a professor who has a Hindu name, but they're going to be teaching the tradition from a completely Marxist lens. Right. And, and, and the problem is, though, that many of our own community children don't know yeah. all of that. And so all of a sudden there's there's a asymmetry of power and your professor who's cool you know has a big bindi yeah. and coal rimmed eyes and a big scarf because that's the leftist costume um you know she's giving a lecture and um your grade depends on learning or you're enamored because this professor is super cool 
And, um, and so we have to, I think, prepare our children at high school to know how to recognize the different biases. And there's still something to maybe learn from a Marxist sure. interpretation of religion or a Freudian. Well, it's a layer. So much, but it's I'm, layer, right? It's one yeah. way of understanding a, a phenomenon, a global phenomenon. Sure. But it's sure. not the only way. And I think that it's a professor's responsibility to say, listen, I view history through a Marxist lens. Put it out right. there. That's yeah. entire honesty. And then that way, at least a student would understand or, uh, you know, lay out there all the different ways in which you can see religion so that right. a student can better recognize. Um, no, I, I think that's I think that's totally right. And, and I think th there's a point you made, which sometimes is is frustrating to me. And and I think it's it's people of our our generation and, and probably even younger generation that have grown up in this country and um, are Hindu or whatever. And, but they tend not to be, I mean, I'm a liberal guy. Like my, my politics is very liberal and, and I, I tend to align that way. But what I'm starting to find is people don't have the, the knowledge of, of the Hindu traditions, religion, whatever. So anything that is said by anybody about Hinduism is automatically like supported, right? Like even this, like one one of my biggest difficulties is this, um, and I'm not a Hindutvan, so I'm not someone that follows Hindutva and whatever. There's a recent article that came out by some guy on the caravan, which is a terrible article, but um, but the idea of Hindu Max, by the way, he's not an analyst or a scholar uh, by any. Yeah, I, I think he's not anybody in terms of like any knowledge or skill set that connected. Um, but my my point is like to even terms like Hindu nationalism. It's such a weird concept to me because what you're trying to do is give this equivalence between white nationalism or European nationalism to something that Hindu, which doesn't have any of those tendencies historically. Like we don't have a sense of a nation of Hindu nation like like this is only for Hindus. We, we know that. But to have that conversation, it becomes like, oh, you're a Hindu to a follower. No, Hindu to me, it just has its own issues, right? It's, it, I think it's a very Abra Abrahamized version of Hinduism. In some sense, it's very reactionary. People are taking up these concepts in a similar way that that happens in Judeo-Christian Islamic framework of how to view it. this has to be the path, the way, the truth, whatever. But I think we're not even allowed to have a conversation about it without being labeled a bigot or this or that. I, I agree. And, and well, first of all, I, th I think that we need to problematize the word. Yeah. That's what academics do. But but in the academic sphere, there's only one understanding of Hindutva. There's not a definition of it, but it's a pejorative and it's used to discredit scholars. It's used to discredit uh, critique, legitimate critique of yep. academics. And it's used to discredit advocacy organizations and Hindus. Yeah. So it's a meaningless term in some sense, or it's a very meaningful term. Meaning, and what I mean by that, it is has many meanings. Yes, right? yeah, yeah. Different people, you ask different people what it means, and different people will say different things. The Supreme Court of India has said one thing. Um, you know, the uh, Sarvarka has said something else. Yeah. Someone else, you ask an average Hindu what they think it is on the street in India, they might say something else. You say, you ask someone on Twitter who maybe identifies as a right. whatever, they might have a different definition. So there's that, but so there's a diversity there, but where there's not a diversity is in the impact sure. and the harm from that particular term. You see um, th that, that caravan article does that. I mean, to suggest, um, I don't even want to mention the name of the article because I don't think it should have any more traffic. Than right, 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 I agree. But, this 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 notion that Hindu Americans who are politically engaged, oh, they are Hindutva. Hindutva is a bad word, so be you know, beware. And Hindutva, if it's a bad word, then it probably needs to be equated with supremacy, misogyny, racism, you name it. All exactly. the things that we don't think are are good for society, for inner people relations, or whatever the case may be, that's what it it is, and that's how it's used. It's weaponized. I actually just wrote, well, so I posted rather, um, I presented at the American Academy of Religions. There were a number of people who, Asha Shipman, who's a chaplain um, up in ba at Yale, um, she suggested this topic. She said, you know, 
many Hindus are afraid to come out and, and speak up about certain things or be proud of their identity because they're afraid of the label Hindutva. Because as soon as you yeah. come out um, assertively, it could be right around the corner, right? So she proposed this uh, panel and um, initially had a hard time getting getting it accepted to, by the yeah. American yeah. Academy of Religion. So we talked back about that cartel. Ultimately, um, you know, there there are smaller sections that have been started at the American Academy of Religions um, and even side meetings um, where we found a space for it. We had a very robust conversation. So I presented a paper uh, called The Weaponization of Hindutva. And I just recently posted it on um, the Hindu American Foundation blog um, and had to split it in two parts because it's long. <laughs> but talk about not just problematizing, and I don't go too deeply into all the multiple meanings of Hindutva, sure. I probably should um, at some point, but talk about how it's been used to discredit, discredit legitimate concerns uh -huh. um, of, of our community and how even words like left and right are so sloppily used. You, you said Especially you're a liberal, yeah. right? You said you're a liberal. I would agree that I am a liberal as yeah. well. Um, at one point, I used the word that I used to self-describe as a progressive, but I don't anymore because yeah. it's taken yeah. on some weird connotation. You know, yeah. High everyone else kind of uh, or anti-majority uh, meaning and not looking at the humanity of every individual. Right. So even left and right, I problematize those terms um, largely in a political sense. But, you know, to say that someone is right wing or left wing, it's really just looking at it through an American lens, which is largely framed by Judeo-Christian pr principles. Right. Then it's going to look different in different places. So I talk about that in that um, in that two part piece as well. Absolutely. I mean, and that's right, right? Like, and, and I think Koshal brings this up pretty often too, which is to call uh, the BJP or Hindutva or whatever right wing, it, it doesn't make sense because it, it sits on the left of spectrum when it, when it comes to everything about economics and all this other stuff. It's right. very much like a socialist kind of ideology. And and I don't want to get into Indian politics, and that's like a whole other uh, basket of, <laughs> of nonsense. Um, but and, and I mean, my area of expertise, anyway. Yeah, it, but to me, the, I guess the bigger point is what I'm saying is, even to express your Hinduness or your positions on Hinduism, and uh, vis-a-vis any other religion, you're instantly, if it doesn't comport with what the majority right now thinks how you want to speak or uh, have the opinion you should have, you're automatically, like you said, labeled Hindutva, right? Like, if, if you think that they're, to have an indigenous perspective upon academic, academic, like, work, you're Hindutva. Like, for example, recently, like, the work that Vishwa and uh, Joydeep yes. did, which I thought was, was, was fantastic work, right? I've read it. I've read, yes. and I've read so much of these old Indology guys, too, and and you, you can clearly see the threads that Vishwa and Adurli are saying. It's very much based on this uh, 18th century, 19th century uh, German Indology, right? And and but people instantly, like most Indologists, call them Hindu to us. But the I but know, and, yeah. and if you know Vishwa, yeah. <laughs> I think it's ludicrous. <laughs> not Hindu at all. Uh, but additional, the flip side is non non Indology people actually tend to write pleasingly and uh and kind of very lo uh laudatory about the the text indology or in people in that in that that sphere tend to be very reactive and i think that's the problem is we have a world that's i mean the way we think about hinduism is through a lens created by indology maintained by indology and even the way americans think about it is based on these guys um and and so when we cross lines we talk about for example like even if we were to talk about things of transgendered or whatever that that hinduism on the whole has been much more open and liberal about these concepts but at the same time then what you say that oh you're just kind of revisionizing his history I'm, I'm like no it's a problem is you have this vision of what you think hinduism is that is built upon some some these premises that are totally flawed right and, you know, look, there's there's not necessarily, 
I, I don't think we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of where there's ways in which to look at a tradition with a particular framework or structure. That might um, reveal interesting things. But when when you insist that that can be the only framework through which you see it, and then you know indigenous frameworks might get squashed or not respected or not given the same level playing field, that's when it becomes a problem, right? Like so, and and this goes across the board. I mean, and in some ways, it it would be asking for a Hindu ethos in the study of religion, right? Because we have darshna, you are looking at things in different ways, and we're okay with disagreeing, and we're okay with uh, you know contradictions. Um, we need a little bit more um, Hindu attitude, I think, in the academic study of religion. I agree with you. I, it, my only point to that was not that that they don't have validity in certain points. Mm -hmm. It's it's that when those views get so entrenched that you're not yes, willing to absolutely. even consider that, okay, there's a, a variant look at something. Let's even have a discussion about it. But instead of having a discussion, you just instantly label someone Hindutva. This, it, it's the same way when someone says, you know, like, okay, I understand that maybe – uh, we don't need to throw white privilege in everyone's face. No, you're a racist if you don't allow. No, let's talk about stuff. It's okay right. to have a conversation. Let's be respectful. Talk about it. We can be critical of each other's views, nuanced. But we don't. What we don't need to do is call name calling. Are, are, we, are we like on the playground when we're two years old? You know, right. this, no, this no. Feels completely like agree. Completely agree. And uh, look, we also have to. You know, there's this there's this seep of like groupism, right? Where we're unwilling to see individual pain and individual suffering. The, yeah. so that, and that's, that's to me, some of the problems in progressive circles, right? Like, well, if you're this, 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 then you're out because you have this many layers of privilege. So shut the hell up and sit down. That's not a constructive way um, sure. us to address the challenges of, of institutionalized racism or bigotry or poverty and all of these issues that uh, the environment all these things we care about that's not going to help right because it's not group versus group it's really about people yeah. and if and if you don't get to the the brass tacks of people then you're not going to be able to solve a problem or or make or make anyone feel accepted you can't groups are entities that exist in concept and concepts they, they're not legitimate you, you can't interact with the group you can't right. interact with people right <laughs> and when you interact with people is when you solve these problems so i mean i think you're 100 percent right here we have to address it that way so let me ask you a few closing questions i have taken sure. so much time no, 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 uh, this has been great. oh it's been fantastic um <laughs> so recently have you and and the other members of hf been dealing with more uh pressure bigotry um and kind of response especially in I, because obviously anything connected to india is obviously connected to hinduism in the way that people view it right like but even when we write about kashmir in some sense uh i'm sure there's been some sort of response oh. from the the larger community especially you guys have spent so much time building coalitions with different religious groups and different organizations have you seen that at any point come under attack recently due to, to what's happened in India. Absolutely. I mean, um, Kashmir is a perfect example. It's, um, you know, the issue of Kashmiri Pandits is one that we've highlighted I mean, yeah. from our inception. And um, to see, like, the complete erasure of what happened to this indigenous community, and, and especially from progressive circles is right. mind boggling. You know, on the one hand, you want to stand for the rights of indigenous people. Here you have the cleansing of 350,000 and yeah. the massacres of thousands and, and rapes and destruction. And to not look, I mean, setting all politics aside, um, whether you, you know, whether you feel this was, it could have been done better. Um, you know, there, there needs to be a, a lifting of communications uh, blocks and all that stuff. I, I can't disagree with you, but to selectively um, highlight the suffering of some groups and not others, um, or some individuals and not others, has been um, eye-opening. I just have a really hard time understanding how that can be justified. 
Sure. Uh, and this is as a as a you know life uh, where HAF is nonpartisan, but as a lifelong personally as a lifelong Democrat, yeah. I'm disillusioned by my party and the response that oh yeah from some ends of the party that have been coming out and yeah. um, you know we're not we're not the party of the people anymore if it's going to be selective in this way. Well, and I agree with you because I mean the one thing that you never see highlighted, and and I'll, I will give you this, Bur, uh, Barca Dutt wrote, recently wrote a piece in Washington Post, so I think was very balanced and a I, solid. Piece. But um, and, we've done an analysis. It's it's on our blog. Yeah. I think there were seventeen or eighteen articles with Barca being the last one. I believe the vast majority none mentioned Kashmiri pundits. Oh, they didn't mention Kashmiri pundits. They don't mention the Valmiki community. They they don't, don't, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they don't. They don't mention, mention the women that, of that, that Buddhists, I mean, Buddhists are part of the the region. I mean, but but the, the bigger part to me that's kind of insane is you we it, 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 especially when we talk about uh, like progressives or liberals or Democrats and feminists, right? We should be. I mean, feminists should be up in arms by the fact that. Men in Kashmir can marry anyone they want and even outside of Kashmir and have property rights for their children. But a woman marries a non-Kashmiri man out of the state, no rights. I mean, are you to blow your mind as a feminist? Be like, how is this even okay? And it's not okay in India, right? It's okay in Kashmir because the constitution of India doesn't apply. Right. I I know. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, I mean, my point is, it's been made into a, a, an issue that's a mono issue versus the fact that there are so many different things to talk about the complexity of the issue that the West should and people in the Democratic Party should be even stopping by and saying, look, maybe this way they did it was wrong, but let's talk about what's going on and not just say, oh, the entire state is incorrect here, right? It's just, it's, it's selective. Look, okay, we can't um, deny the uh the the lobbying efforts of, of Pakistan government and um and the rallying around this issue that globally many Muslim organizations have put their weight behind it. So in some sense, even if it's not a Hindu Muslim issue, it's being forced as one. And there's definitely elements of that. I mean, the insurgency and the cleansings that have occurred in the valley are are religiously based um but uh there's there's constitutional safeguards that were being denied from these people i mean you know we've been we've been on the hill going up and down offices we had a briefing um for the senate staff yesterday on this very issue i had conversations yesterday where people with a straight face asked me well what about you know concerns about demographic shifts and i said as an american how can you ask that question? Are, are we going to begin having that conversation for our country to say, well, we don't want too many people of this color. If, if, if we have that conversation, yeah. what's that person gonna be labeled? What about the demographic shifts? Like, should we have too many people of this race or religion move into this country? And maybe we should legislate so that doesn't happen. Hello, this is what the civil rights movement was about to a, right. get rid of that. Is it? It has it become a reality where, you know, those types of considerations are not part of, um, you know, keeping some people out and keeping some people in? No, but th there's at least an ideal that we have agreed upon that, you know, we're all equal. And as people, as members and citizens of a country, we have the free right to movement within our own country. Right. So when but that has helped to have the conversation in that way to all of a sudden they're like, oh, wait a minute. Now I see what I'm saying. Yeah, because it, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and, yeah. and, but this is the importance of like the work you guys are doing is it's understanding something from a different perspective, right? Like you look at something like Kashmir, like, oh my God. But the moment you phrase it as free movement of people within your own country, that, and, and you think in America, you're like, oh, what if suddenly they decided that half the country you can't let Latinos into because it'll change demographics. Would anyone in this country be okay? No. Right. Exactly. No. And not only that, but I, I mean, then, okay, if you're concerned about demographic shifts, then let's acknowledge what's happened over the past 70 years. 
and the demographic shifts that did occur as a result of a proxy war in which right. Pakistan has partnered with terrorist outfits. Right. But that's not part of the conversation. Well, maybe it's the conversation in some circles um, in Washington, D.C. Right. Because there are people who know this issue inside and out. And there are others who maybe don't know it. As long as they express some curiosity and are open to learning, great. That's why we're here. But what, what the media is doing is complete irresponsible right. irresponsible it's a campaign of disinformation and so, I, you know it's inexcusable quite frankly so let me ask you another question and this might be a little more icky so if you don't feel like answering it's fine <laughs> is it difficult um to separate out uh when you're talking about hindu versus india yes and no um yes and no the way that we approach these issues Look, we have been critical of the government of India, and we have supported certain policies um, yeah. for the government of India. So we're not here to represent the government of India. Right. We're here to represent the well-being of Hindus. We we also believe that if if policies um, allow for the well-being of Hindus, then all people, it's going to ensure the well-being of all people, right? right. So. Um, we have members who are Hindus of non-Indian descent. Sure. Advocate for Hindus who are Pakistani, Bangladeshi, mm -hmm. Malaysian, uh, Trinidadi. Um, now, many of them are of, are ultimately of Indian descent, um, but they're not Indian anymore, right? They're Fijian or Sri Lankan or whatever the case may be. So, um, is there overlap between? Indian culture and Hinduism, absolutely. Sometimes it's right. really hard to separate the two, uh, but we do see a distinction. Um, but we also see India as a sacred homeland, uh, because right. as you mentioned earlier, in terms of the temples and why certain temples exist where they do, there's a there, there's a sacred history, or as Diana Eck has said, it there's a sacred geography. Yeah, exactly. So um, in that sense, uh, it's hard to pull away from from India, um, and and I mentioned like that sense of belonging. But yeah. the the last thing is that oftentimes what happens on the ground in India reflects on us as Hindus here. Sure. And therein lies the challenge, where we may not speak out on every single issue uh -huh. um, it, uh, that occurs in India, but there are times when we will because you know, maybe our American neighbors or colleagues are asking about it. And so sure. there's a need to um, clarify, because oftentimes what happens in the media, and this is across the board in its coverage of religion, either the role of religion in a particular phenomenon is ignored or it's overstated. It's really hard to find when the balance is just right. So, right. you know, suppose there's some incident of communal violence in India, while there might be two different religious communities, it might have been over a border dispute or right. a property clash or, you know, some other sort of social issue that was underlying it. But it gets framed as Hindu Muslim. Right. right. So um, so those are the places where we sometimes get pulled in um, to situations. But right. for Kashmir, um, our our intent and our motivation was that here is a, a a group of Hindus that have been persecuted and they're no different than Hindus in Bangladesh or in Malaysia. They just happen to be, you know, uh, what's it called? They, they, they just happen to have been persecuted within their own. Nation. Right. right. So. I, I mean, just to comment on Kashmir, then two questions and we'll close out. Um, so on the Kashmir situation, I think from a Hindu perspective, it is part of Devabhumi, right? For us, it is, it's part of the sacred geography of, of what's, it's the civilizational hub of part of India. I mean, not India, of a Hindu ethos, right? So much of our history and, and our connection is to the Kashmir region. Um, so it, 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 yeah. I mean, it used to be a center for Buddhist and Hindu learning, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and even Adi Shankaracharya, when he right about where he saw kind of you know where he traveled yeah so i mean like in some sense a, a part of kashmir is very similar to what Mus uh, mecca medina would be for uh for for muslims or uh, you know israel the vatican might be for christians and jews it's it is a a central part of in of of hinduists 
right? There, there are so many uh, yatras there to go to and visit. But I mean, I'm just saying, and, and from that perspective, it is important for Hindus too okay. that reach it. From that perspective, even Pakistan has. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but what I was just saying, it's it's. It, I'll there, go there. <laughs> yeah, there's no way for us to go to Pakistan, right? But right. Uh, we should be able to, if it's part of India, to still go to, and see and, India with that. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, so with Amarnath, for instance, that there have been there have been phases in which yeah. tourism increased. But yeah. there are many times when tourists, Hindu tourists, and, you know, I'm not even tourists, I want to say pilgrims, yeah. were attacked. Uh, yeah. So it was not safe for Hindus to go to their sacred sites to worship. Right. So now the question. Um, uh, there's two questions. So the first one is this is the first, I think, large election cycle in the U.S. in which we have a candidate who is out and out a Hindu, who has who has been wearing it on her on her sleeve, but has also come with some amazing credentials. Right. She served in the military, you know, was a, a, a senator or representative in Hawaii and then now is a congresswoman. It's her entire life has been like very Hindu and then service oriented and very American. So th it's like this point of somewhat pride and she's not Indian, which is even some ways cooler because it, it shows the, the pan-ness of, of the, in, uh, the Hindu ideas. Um, how do you think that has impacted the community on a whole and has there been any negative reactions to it? Uh, so on, you know, as far as it, impact on the community i think it's been a very positive one yeah uh, i think that um many hindus from india are very self-conscious sometimes of their religious identity for you know i don't know what a variety of reasons um colonialism might still be playing a, a role in that uh, but generally i think we're you know not necessary we don't have to talk about it maybe and so it's not yeah. part of our culture to you know um, well, we're also the other, whereas others you can get. So right, right. so um, so I think that um, to see someone who's like not self conscious about it, I think is liberating. And and I know from my conversations with a lot of young people, and even for myself, just seeing that this is powerful. This is you know it's just downright awesome to see like a congresswoman who's at a rally and, and it happens to be Janmashmi. So she's like, you know what? I'm going to lead you all in Kirtan. Like that's yeah. pretty phenomenal. I think that in some ways, um, like the, the, the Trinidad diaspora also has that similar um, resource of people who can inspire. Uh, I believe when the first prime minister, I don't know if you're the first, but when, um, she was or he was elected i'm getting my i'm forgetting but you know the whole group she led the whole like group of people that had gathered i'm talking thousands in Hanuman yeah. Kaisa. like when you have something like that it makes it okay to be hindu and to right. be not just to be okay to be hindu but to be proud of our right. tradition and i think the other thing that she um is so um, good at and about is articulating um, the inspiration that she draws from Hinduism into basically what's been a life of service. Right. And and I think that it's um, for me at least hard not to see how um, it's this tradition that also kind of um, inspires her approach. She's very measured. She's yeah. Very Thoughtful. Um, this is all in my personal capacity that I'm sharing this because HF is nonpartisan. But yeah. you know that um, that thoughtfulness. I think you see it in, in other legislators too, who are grounded in the tradition. Raja Krishnamurthy is another one mm -hmm. um, who I, I deeply admire and respect. Uh, that you know they they don't scream. Uh, so there's there's just um, a, a groundedness about them that I think, um, at least for me, I see it as being rooted in in our teachings. Um, in terms of negative things that have come across, absolutely. We, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Yeah. That this um, you know bogeyman of of uh, of Hindutva um, so often has has been brought up to not only try to discredit. Uh, Tulsi, not only to try to discredit or attack Raja, but also 
those Hindu Americans who are slowly starting to find their political voice and maybe start making political contributions or run political office, um, this term is uh, thrown at them to discredit. And, um, you know, whether it's been successful or not, I don't know. But, um, you know, if we don't do enough to educate people about what it is to be Hindu, um, they may very easily and mistakenly conflate the two. And um, that's where our work comes in, um, not just for those of us at the Hindu American Foundation, but all of us as Hindus to, you know, be more open about having conversations about what we believe and what inspires us and how we lead our lives and how we contribute to our communities inspired by this tradition. Sure. Uh, Last question, and then I'll let you go. (laughs) Uh, So what, uh, it's kind of a two part, what's in the future for you? Like, is there anything that you're pursuing on your own that you want to like kind of throw our light towards? And what's in the future kind of that you're planning with uh, HAF at this point? Um, so, wow, I haven't even thought about uh, what I would do. Um, I mean, like I find a book or anything like I, that or anything. Oh, well, I, I've had a lot of people asking me to write a book. I wouldn't even know where to start, but but maybe there's a book in the future. Um, now that I've said it, now I might have to hold myself to it. Um, but um, I see myself, you know, I, I've been doing advocacy for many years. And one of the things that I'm really focusing for HAF is kind of institution building and succession planning that I want, you know, as a co-founder, I've obviously been here from day one, but I want HAF to be around for future generations. So um, building the infrastructure that will then host the next ED, the ED after that, yeah. so the HF is around for you know my great grandchildren ultimately. So um, that's kind of a long term vision uh, for HAF. Um, in the short term, we are hiring <laughs> for a director of uh, community programs and and probably soon a director of public policy to meet kind of our immediate needs. Um, and so uh, scaling our work increasing our membership because an institution is only as strong as the support that we have from the community. So we need to improve our brand recognition as well and make Hindu American Foundation a household name. Um, And then once all that's established and maybe, you know, Suhag Shukla is no longer the ED, uh, I'd like to kind of go back to grassroots um, seva, whether that's in India or, or here in my local neighborhood and working with um, underprivileged communities or, or kids or something, I, I think I'll still be um, pursuing service. Um, I just don't know how. Excellent. On that note, how can people volunteer or assist HAF? And if there is, um, what kind of things can they do to assist HAF? Sure. And if they can, how do they contact you guys? So um, you can come to our website, www.hafsite.org. Obviously, you can support us with a contribution. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're nonpartisan, so all all contributions are tax deductible. Um, we, if you join our mailing list, we oftentimes have action alerts. We're an advocacy organization, so we don't always have like hands-on volunteering opportunities, mm-hmm. but um, we do have chapters in a variety of regions in the San Francisco Bay Area, in the Tampa area in Florida, South Florida, um, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas, and a couple of other emerging chapters. Uh, so you can be on the lookout to see if there's a chapter in your neck of the woods. Um, but otherwise, if you join our mailing list, we very often have action alerts Um so that you could maybe make a call to Congress um, or to your local congressman or write a letter to the editor. Um, We also often have webinars where you can get certain types of trainings. So whether it's Mm -hmm. Temple Safety and Security or Know Your Rights um, or Dharma Ambassadors Program in which we are um, teaching our own community members on how to teach about Hinduism to non-Hindu audiences so that they can get involved in interfaith or at the school level or or whatever. So there's a variety of ways that um, people can can kind of join the cause. Awesome. Thank you so much.